Nada. Okay. Okay. Ready? Good afternoon, everybody. Can you all hear me? Can we get everybody to grab a seat somewhere that, so that you can see the screen? We've set up the new Digital Humanities Center so that you can see all the cool stuff that's going to go in front of you here. I want to welcome everybody. My name is um, Catherine D. Harris. Not Catherine Harris, Catherine D. Harris. And uh, I'm the Director of Public Programming for the College of Humanities and Arts. I'm also a professor of literature and digital humanities. And it's my um, really, really incredible, um, this is an incredible moment, sorry. It's, I've been here for almost 19 years and opening of the DH Center has been something that's been a very long time dream. And to also bring people outside from San Jose State so that they can see the incredible people that I work with and everything that y'all do together and our amazing students who are sitting over on the sides and in the seats beside you. So I really hope that we have a good time today as we do, we listen to Dr. Lauren Klein talk about data feminism for AI. I have a few things to start us off, and then we've got a few people talking, and then Lauren's going to come up here and tell us all about what we need to know. The first thing that I want to ask everybody to do is just a little reminder to silence your cell phones. Just take a moment to do that. Make sure there's no buzzing either, because we can really hear everything in here. Um, welcome to the new Digital Humanities Center. On the front row here, we've got a lot of our co-sponsors, including a bunch of deans who are here who will, we will name in a little bit for us. Uh, we also have over here at this table the Responsible Computing Club uh, students. They just came together about four weeks ago. They came out of the Mozilla uh, Foundation Responsible Computing efforts by Circle. They're monitoring the chat, and Lauren, close your ears. We have 400 people who registered for online from China, Australia, Russia, England, <laughs> everywhere. A testament to far-reaching ideas by Lauren herself. So they're taking care of keeping the community alive in chat as they go along. So please forgive them as they type. They're dropping links in to keep community going. The other thing I'd like you to do is check your, your chairs for stickers and swag from the Responsible Computing Club, from Circle, from h and in Action, uh, from an Expressions, which is also a series of stories from h and as well. Feel free to take those with you. And here's a little Easter egg for everybody sitting at the tables. Those white things and boxes sitting at the table are power banks. Please take one. There's only about two at every table, so y'all will have to duel over them to see who gets one. Please don't fight each other, though. We have more we can bring you. I want to thank our sponsors, SJSU's h and in Action and the College of Humanities and Arts and Dean Shannon Miller. I'd also like to thank Circle, Cross-Campus, Interdisciplinary Responsible Computing Learning Experience, SJSU's College of Data and Information, Information, Data, and Society. It's a new college, so I'm just getting it down. And it's their Committee on Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Social Justice. I'd also like to thank the SJSU's Lucas College of Graduate School of Business, and SJSU's Department of Humanities, and then also the Responsible Computing Club itself as well. We encourage everybody who's joining us online to participate in the chat. Respond to each other, but keep it clean. We do have students who are monitoring it, and they will give you information as they go along. Please adhere to the rules of engagement, and that just means a code of conduct in Zoom like we all know. No Zoom bombing, please. I think we're all beyond that, right? Right? Everybody? We're beyond that, right? Okay. Thank you to everybody who showed up in person as well. It's incredible to see everybody coming together. We really love to see people come into the Digital Humanities Center, too. Um, we have uh, this large online audience, and what I would like the online audience to remember is please submit your questions in the webinar Q&A. We will be doing Q&A both in person from people in Zoom as well as the pre-submitted questions. 
What I would like to do next is introduce President Teniente Matson. She has been a leader on our campus for a little over a year and allowing us the freedom to soar in talking about AI, social justice, and really creating much more of a footprint in San Jose itself. So President, I welcome you. Well, it's an honor to be here. It's this recent opening of the Digital Humanities Center, and it really grounds us in what this means for our community, what it means for our learning, what it means for our teaching, what it means for engagement. As we think about this and right in the entryway to the Martin Luther King Library, the symbolism of digital humanities and the reflections of the learning that comes together in a place like this that also allows us to challenge, which is part of what we think about when we think about ourselves at San Jose State University. I'm always grounded on the fact that we are at the epicenter of the future in a very powerful time and a very powerful moment for what the future of humanity and civic engagement looks like. And conversations like the one we're going to have today gives us a look under the hood or around the corner or into the digital toolbox of how we think about some of these narratives to ensure the broadest engagement possible as we think about learning and as we think about teaching and we think about our own existence. One of the things I said to a group of students that were graduating last spring in my challenge to them was to be the best prompt engineer possible. And it raised some eyebrows, like, what in the heck? Why would you say that? And I said to them, I'm not expecting all of you to become computer engineers or software engineers. That's not what that statement is about. That statement is about a new set of skills that are going to be necessary in the next generation of living and learning and existing, not only fueled by uh, machine learning, large language models, the convergence of technologies, and artificial intelligence, how we think about that response and how we think about existing in that world is going to call for a new set of skills and languages. And that's part of what I hope we're here about today in the new vernacular or nomenclature of what the world will be like. I know for students that are in the room and those that are online, you're gonna experience the world and create a world very different than what I've experienced and what I can possibly imagine. You, at some point in your career, will be in space. People will be living and working in space. We're already doing that research now. We're already sending people up into space. All of these things are made possible by new forms of thinking. And that's part of what today is all about. So I am so excited to welcome you, Lauren, Dr. Klein, for sharing with us as a co-author of Data Feminism, but most importantly, as I said, what it means to be launching that conversation and dialogue right here in the Digital Humanities Center. I also want to thank uh, Dean Miller, Dean of the College, and Dr. H Catherine Harris, D. Harris, uh, Director of our Public Programming, um, and helping to bring these programs together along with the library. It's really important that as the epicenter of the future, we are deeply engaged in these conversations. And within our city, within the city of San Jose, what this building itself represents in the initial partnership over 20 years ago now, and what that means for us in the city going forward as we think about our pilot initiatives that will launch AI initiatives right here in this building, theoretically right across the way. So I look forward to the engagement today and the conversation. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for being here. Hello, hi everyone. My name is Nada Tar, and I'm from the Computer Science Department. I want to talk to you today about our Circle Mozilla project. So, so Circle is a cross-campus interdisciplinary responsible computing learning experience, and it's funded by uh, Mozilla Foundation. 
It's one of the 15 uh, projects that were, uh, won uh, the Responsible Computing Challenge. And we've been uh, working uh, in the past years to achieve um, uh, uh, creating a community that cares about ethical considerations in computer science. And uh, we have uh, achieved uh, several uh, things, so I'm going to talk about it quickly. So we created uh, an, uh, a framework where we can revise uh, courses and make it more um, uh, considering the uh, the ethical consideration and ethical AI. For example, we revised a computer vision course, and now it's uh, it's considered uh, bias in data in, in data set, uh, bias in the algorithms. Um, we talk also about privacy and uh, surveillance. So when students take these courses, they just learn algorithm, but they also think about the impact that they can have uh, on the societies. We also created new courses, such as human-computer interaction, but this course will care about human welfare and, uh, for example, the uh, importance of uh, user consent and uh, bias uh, in, in interfaces. So when we teach students computer science courses or data science courses, they are more aware of the impact that they can do when they go to the world and to the industry and create these uh, products and algorithms. We've also um, uh, held a uh, uh, few events. So with the, the Circle Speaker Series, we have it uh, both in person and virtually. And uh, the thing is, when we started, we had around 30% capacity, but um, with the last events, we reach 100% capacity. And that shows that the SJSU community, they do care about uh, ethical AI and responsible computing. We had famous speakers such as Dr. Alex Hanna, who came and uh, she gave her amazing talk about AI and uh, data. So we also have Responsible Computing Action Guide where uh, any faculty, staff, or student can use to uh, help them more into uh, ethical AI, into uh, uh, cultural competence, and all these topics that they can use. And we've, we're gonna launch Canvas modules soon this semester. And these Canvas modules, uh, the Circle uh, modules, they have several, uh, Submodules where you can, any professor can integrate those modules into their class, and some of them are technical, some of them they don't require any technical background. So, not only the computer science courses, they can add them, but any uh, courses in other departments, they can also integrate these modules into their classes. They come with assignments, with quizzes and questions, so they, uh, they can provide this responsible computing learning into any course. Um, it, they are open also to faculty, to, uh, to staff, to students, and they can work as a whole as a, a training uh, module. And we also uh, have Circle Sandbox, and Circle Sandbox are data set that any uh, faculty or student can use it into their courses and their project, and it will help them to have data that is uh, not biased, and it will help them to do different kind of projects on it. And the last thing that we have, which is just recent, we are um, sponsoring and um, mentoring the uh, uh, Responsible Computing Club. Uh, we are uh, providing them with guidance and funds, and it's amazing to see that the students now are taking the lead into, uh, ha into you know, uh, this uh, learning, uh, ethical AI and uh, responsible computing. And uh, one of the recent things that we are also doing is we're gonna start with Mozilla Foundation. Uh, to have a workshop. It will start on November 11th. Uh, so with this workshop, uh, the students will learn how to design AI modules uh, using LAMA files, and they will use projects that are related to the environments and the, um, the, the you know, things that we care about, for example, avoiding surveillance and um, 
AI um, ethics and bias in the algorithms. So they will develop things that you know, that Mozilla Foundation care about also. And at the end, they will uh, present it at Mozilla Foundation Center at San Francisco. So if you are interested in trying our modules or our data set and sandbox, or to see how we revised our courses to include uh, ethical considerations and responsible computing, uh, you can please find these postcards or you can talk to our students. We have amazing students here, or you can email us. Um, so yeah, so thank you for uh, being here today. And we are honored uh, to have with us Lorraine Klein. So Lorraine is a Winship Distinguished Research Professor and Associate Professor in the Department of Quantitative Theory and Methods and English at Emory University. At Emory, she also serves as a Director of the Digital Humanities Lab and a PI of the Mellon-funded Atlanta Interdisciplinary AI Network. Previously, she taught in the School of Literature, Media, and Communication at Georgia Tech. Klein's research brings together computational and critical methods in order to explore questions of gender, race, and justice, both in the past and in the present. She's the author of An Archive of Taste, Race, and Eating in the, in the Early United States, with Catherine DeYangzo and award-winning Data Feminism. With Matthew Gold, she edits debates in the digital humanities, a hybrid, digital, uh, hybrid print digital publication stream that explores debates in the field as they emerge. Her work has appeared in leading humanities journal, including PMLA, American Literature, and American Quarterly, and at technical conferences, including FACT, ACL, and IEEE VIS. Her research has been su supported by grants and fellowship from the ACLS, the NAH, and the Mellon Foundation. Her next major project, Data by Design, a History in Five Charts, is forthcoming from the MIT Press in 2025. So please join me in welcoming Lauren Klein. Thank you so much, Nada, for that really kind and generous introduction, and also for telling us all about the amazing work that you're doing as part of the Responsible Computing Initiative and Circle. Thank you for your presence uh, to the president and to all of the uh, institutional leadership who members who are here. It's really, it's amazing that you're all here individually, but also, I was saying before, together. Um, you know, one of my really most deeply held beliefs is that the research challenges that we face right now are so complicated and also interesting because they're deeply interdisciplinary. And if we're ever going to have any hope of intervening into them, things like climate change, things like misinformation, things like this, then we are going to need every single aspect of disciplinary expertise coming to the table together. And the fact that you're all able and willing to make yourselves available in moments like this just means, means so much. So thank you for being here and for listening. So, um, is this audio level okay? Okay, I'm not gonna touch it anymore. Okay, um, so, um, and also Kathy, thank you also for setting all of this up. This is, this is amazing. Like, look, look at all this. We should thank Kathy. So uh, before I begin, actually, one more acknowledgement. All of the uh, work that I'm speaking about today comes from co-authored work with Catherine D'Ignazio, who you can see up there. She's an associate professor of urban science and planning at MIT. And in the book that we wrote together called Data Feminism, which you can see up there, it's also available open access, um, we present a set of principles for doing more equitable and empowering data science that are informed by intersectional feminism. And what I'm going to do in my talk today is talk a little bit about our motivation for writing the book and a little bit about the definition of feminism that we bring to our writing. But then what I want to do is turn towards the current conversation about AI and think through uh, questions about how these principles can either be applied or need to be rethought in the present environment. So I'm just going to jump right in. So as we were writing the book, we were increasingly aware that data was becoming this incredible form of power. And I think, you know, to be honest, all of us were, right? We were 
all learning from the researchers whose books and other forms of scholarship you see up here on the screen. So people like Sophia Noble, um, Virginia Eubanks, Julia Angwin, Surya Matu, Ruha Benjamin, Joy Bolamwini, um, uh, Maggie Walter, and others in the world of indigenous state of sovereignty. You know, what all of this work, and this is not even, you know, a tenth of it, but what all of this work was pointing to was, yes, uh, data was and remains incredibly powerful, but that power was and remains uh, incredibly uneven. Um, and more specifically, what we see is the power of data being wielded by a small and homogenous group of institutions, um, corporations, and well-resourced governments, um, usually for their own benefit, right? These are the people who have the resources to design and deploy these data systems. And usually this comes at the expense of everyone else. And this is where Catherine and I really saw the role of feminism entering in. And what we explain in the book is how feminism and intersectional feminism in particular has been focused on precisely this, on imbalances of power and the structural forces that cause them. This has been the central project of feminism for a very, very long time. So, you know, one of the things, I, I have a lot of different roles and teach a lot of different kinds of classes, but my PhD is actually in English. So I actually, I, I pay a lot of attention to language. And one of the things that is really interesting to me are the words that are used in order to describe AI systems, both their strengths and their weaknesses. And I was struck a couple of months ago when people started talking about the brittleness of AI systems, which they would define as this idea that AI systems are optimized for certain scenarios or certain groups and break in other, insta uh, other instances. But, and then, you know, when people would talk about this brittleness, they would, they would be sort of surprised that this was happening, like why, they would say. But this basic idea that systems, not necessarily technical systems, but social systems, government systems, you know, institutional systems are optimized for certain groups and not others, you know, this is not a surprise to feminists, right? Um, or just, you know, the basic idea of bias training data, right? Um, you know, again, people experience the effects of these biases with such surprise. How could this happen? People wonder. But the idea that biases are pretty much baked into the cultural record, this is really the ground truth of much feminist work. And I think I'll, you know, I'll just also say, because we're standing here, I'm standing here, you're sitting here, um, in this beautiful Digital Humanities Center, you know, I have this long history of work in the digital humanities, and one of the major takeaways from my time in DH, as we call it, is that feminism is absolutely essential. Um, it's really an essential tool in our toolbox if we want to make these sort of liberatory data science or AI-infused projects. Um, you know, I just think it's really important to recognize both that I am drawing from in this work, this long history of feminism, as well as a lot of applied practice in the digital humanities space. So before moving forward to get to the AI part of this talk, I did want to take a couple of minutes to talk a little bit about what I mean when I say feminism. You know, feminism means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And it's always really important before mobilizing this term to say and own what kind of feminism it is that you're bringing to the table. So very briefly, the feminism that Catherine and I mobilize in the book is at its core. Um, a belief in equality for all genders. So this includes men and women, cis and trans people, non-binary folks as well. But one of the things that happens when you look around you is you realize that this belief in equality for all genders has not yet been realized in the world today. And so a really essential second component of Catherine and my feminism is a sort of necessary activity or activism on behalf of women and non-binary folks in order to make this goal of equality the reality. And then there's a third definition of feminism that we mobilize in the book. Um, and this is actually just a set of theories and ideas. So these theories began by thinking through issues of inequality with respect to gender, but the past 40 years of scholarship, the ongoing political reality, have brought many, many more dimensions of inequality into the conversation. So these include race, these include class, these include sexuality, ability, immigration status, and more. Which brings me up to the idea of intersectional feminism. And again, this is sort of a term that you have probably heard at this point, um, but I think it's important to say out loud this comes to us from a specific source and a specific um, group of people who were doing the work, who were women of color feminists and black feminists in the United States in particular. 
and what feminism gains more broadly from this work, so you could think of concepts like the Cumbahee River Collective's formulation of interlocking systems of oppression, Kimberly Crenshaw's term, intersectionality, Patricia Hill Collins's idea of what she calls the matrix of domination. These are formal frameworks, and what they do is they enable us to structure critiques of power. And so what this enables is a real atomization, a really nuanced understanding of the reasons why people experience privilege on the one hand um, or oppression on the other. And very crucially, once we understand, again, with precision why these things are happening, we can take steps to challenge them and change them. So what Catherine and I do in the book is use these teachings of intersectional feminism along with other ideas from feminist activism and critical thought in order to arrive at these seven principles for doing more ethical and equitable data science. You can see them right here. Um, examine power, challenge power, rethink binaries and hierarchies, elevate emotion and embodiment, embrace pluralism, consider context, and make labor visible. And in the book, this is actually the structure of the book. So we have one chapter devoted to each principle where we talk a little bit about the feminist theory that's underlying it, and then illustrate how it can be applied through just a lot, a lot of examples. Um, and I will say, you know, our goal with this book and with the project overall was really to sort of operationalize feminism for data science work. We were trying to provide a clear set of principles or guidelines for people who are currently working with data but want to do so more equitably, um, for people who want to work with data, including students, but who have sort of yet to learn the best practices for doing so, or what we think are the best practices for doing so, um, or even for people who want to refuse to work with data but want the evidence in order to back up their claims. And we can talk a little bit more that, about that uh, later. Now, all this work, you know, the book came out in 2020. I'm actually in the first week of the pandemic, <laughs> what we did not know at the time, but would change our world. Um, and these principles were actually formulated even before that, and certainly before this most recent wave of Gen AI and all the AI hype and the AI doom that we've now become accustomed to. But Catherine and I still like to speak about data feminism to call us back to the idea that all of AI and algorithms and all these language models that we're seeing right now, they're ultimately powered by data. And many of the biases and the inequalities that we see these models reproducing in the world are related to problems with data. So what I'm going to do in the next section of my talk is to briefly discuss two forms of what Catherine and I call data problems. Um, these are missing data and bias data. And what I'm going to do is show how they have many, many downstream effects. So in one example that actually is from the book, and every time I think about getting a newer example, I just, I can't bring myself to replace this because it's an amazing project. It's an artwork. It's created by Mimi Onwoha. She's an artist and educator living in New York City, and it's called the Library of Missing Data Sets. And what she does in order to make this point about the unequal power that contributes to missing data um, is first to create just a GitHub repository. That's what you see on the right. Um, this lists names of data sets that you might expect to exist because they address issues of pressing social need. But in reality, they just don't exist in the world. So I don't know if you can read all of these on the screen, but there's things like uh, mobility for older adults with physical disabilities or cognitive impairments. Data does not, systemic data does not exist on this. LBGT, older adults discriminated against in housing. Again, this is an issue that you know should be addressed, but there is not a comprehensive study of this so that an intervention cannot be made. Um, in any case, this is only one way to encounter this work. The second is as a physical artwork. That's actually what you see on the other side of the screen. So in this version of the piece, the data sets are the labels on these little file folders. Um, you identify a data set that seems interesting to you um, or important. You might go you know, tab through the folders, open the folder. Um, but when you go to learn more, the folder is empty. So here the data sets are physically missing. And you know, the point that Onwoha is trying to make here with this piece is that these data sets, they're missing for a reason. And that reason is the profound imbalance of power with respect to data collection in the world today. 
Um, so who has this power? Again, generally speaking, it's governments, moneyed institutions, corporations, um, the people who have the resources to design and deploy these, um, these data systems. And generally speaking, minoritized groups don't have the ability to collect data at scale on the problems that matter to them or to us. Um, and this is why a feminist approach to data and to AI always needs to begin with this analysis of power because far too often the data sets that we can access um, and in turn the models that they're used to train and then in turn the research questions that we can ask using these models that have been developed. Um, they, these, the, all of these things have already been overdetermined by the imbalance of power that we face in the world. And so this is actually precisely what we see in this set of projects uh, led by Rita Quadri, Fuchsia Hart, Katrina Sluis, and a couple of other people about the uses of Islamic art and text to image models. So what they show is in spite of the wide variety of actual Islamic art in the world, the range of images that these models are able to create are in fact quite narrow. Um, and this is because of multiple layers of colonial power that contribute to the training data that we can access today. So first, the power of the European explorers to initially decide which artifacts they liked when they encountered them and therefore to sort of select for preservations and which ones would not be preserved and therefore um, not still exist into the present. Then there's the power of the world's major art museums, which are themselves colonial institutions. So these are the institutions deciding which among their you know, tens of thousands of artifacts and their holdings should be digitized so that we have access to the digital version of them. Um, and then you feed this in, all of this data into these text to image models as was actually done. Um, and when these text to image models are asked to produce images of Islamic art, you get very limited examples and with this sort of colonial viewpoint embedded inside. And these end up confirming a very narrow view of what matters in the world of Islamic art and what does not. And I think more broadly, this particular example is a really interesting one. A of all, because it's one that we probably haven't really necessarily encountered in our own world. We haven't um, really thought about this particular one before. Um, but it really sort of stands to show what happens when the unequal power surrounding data creation is allowed to compound and accrue and accumulate. Um, or here's another example from a, uh, a totally different domain, which is AI-assisted healthcare. So one of the projects that I've been involved with recently has to do with the introduction of so-called um, AI scribes into medical offices. So these are AI assistants that listen into your visit with your doctor and then automatically synthesize a transcript of the encounter into the electronic health record, the EHR, which now through federal law is required to be provided after any visit that you have with a clinician. Um, and so the interesting thing here is that doctors are really excited about this possibility because all of these documentation demands are the number one leading cause of burnout among physicians. So when you ask doctors like what would make you quit your job, they say number one documentation. I'm being like, it's, it's overwhelming. And the idea that AI could ease this burden and give doctors time to focus on patient care is really promising. But the thing is, all of these known issues with missing, da missing tra training data and bias training data, they all come into play here. So for example, if a story that a patient relates during a visit to a doctor is similar to one that's in the training data, the details of it can be merged. Um, or worse, if certain aspects of a patient ident identity can be inferred from the conversation, um, racial, ethnic, or cultural stereotypes can be actively inserted into these transcripts. Um, so these are all based on text-to-speech systems, which um, are really only trained on so-called like normative English. So if you speak English as a second language or what is in effect like, you know, not white Midwestern English, then the transcript of your encounter with your doctor is less accurate, leading to ongoing sort of less accurate medical care. Um, you know, because these are generative models and not logic-based, the, tra the uh, transcripts might substitute the name of one medicine with another in your file. Like, the list goes on and on. I mean, it is really shocking every single general observation about the potential harms with biased models is coming into play in a very, very real-world context. Um, now, I like this example because it's a tricky one. 
even in spite of this, doctors still really want to use these systems because they still represent a net reduction in workload. And there's real potential for these systems to improve patient care, right? If the doctor's not taking notes while they're talking to you, they can actually listen to you, right? We should all want that. Um, but, um, you know, I should say also, and I mentioned this before, like all of these instances of bias are, are really well known more broadly. Um, and this is really where I see a role of feminism entering in because until our world is free from bias, we will continue to encounter these biases in the world in any model that we train. So we're going to continue to need theories like feminism that help us understand why these biases are happening in the world um, to be able to anticipate them um, and then account for them, and ideally, ultimately, to be able to challenge and change them. So the question then becomes, you know, like, how do we do this? <laughs> Everyone's on board, right? We should all want this. Um, and one example comes to us from feminist data activists in Latin America. And this is another example, actually, from the book. It's the story of a woman named Maria Salguero. Uh, Maria Salguero. Um, she's a Mexican citizen. And she identified an instance of missing data relating to an issue that she cared very much about, which was feminicide. So feminicide is the gender-related killing of women and girls. They, these include both cis and trans women, and they're, uh, not only they, do they take place everywhere, um, not just in Mexico, this is just where Salguero lives, um, but they're also legally defined as crimes in almost all of these countries. But the issue is that in spite of laws on the books defining feminicide as a crime, there is not data to document the extent of the problem, and therefore feminicide as an issue cannot be structurally or systematically addressed. Salgado, she became really frustrated by this lack of action. And so what she decided to do was single-handedly compile a data set of feminicides that were taking place in her country. She spends two to four hours per day logging feminicides on a Google map. Um, and she's been doing this since um, 2016, so almost 10 years. And as a result of this work, she's compiled the single largest data set of feminicide in Mexico. And ironically, because of this data, she's helped families locate loved ones, provided information to NGOs, and has been called in to testify in Mexican Congress on multiple occasions because she, a private citizen, knows more about the extent of this issue than any federally elected officer. And so in data feminism, we describe this as a form of what might be called feminist counter data collection or activist data collection that steps in when the state and other institutions have systematically failed to ensure the basic safety of their population. And it represents one way to use data to challenge power. And actually, one of the interesting things is in the course of doing research for this book, we discovered, mostly Catherine discovered, actually, that um, grassroots and feminist data activism um, is taking place throughout Latin America and also the Caribbean and also the US and also Canada. And so Catherine actually just published a new book called Counting Feminicide, which is all about this. And it's very fascinating and is available open access online if you're curious. Um, and I'll actually return to one of the topics that's brought up in this book later on. Um, but I wanted to turn to uh, one of the questions that I think is often asked about this practice of counter data collection, um, which is like, that's all great. But that was just one person in one place doing her own work. How can this possibly scale, right? Like, how can this scale to meet the demands of AI and its sort of rapacious training data needs? But the thing is, it really can. Um, so this can involve the creation of new data sets for training AI models. So you can see this with the project up on, uh, let's see. Well, the, all of these are about sort of new data. but. Um, the project up on the right of your screen, which involves a Maori-led uh, project to re revitalize Te Real, this is the Maori language, through the use of AI. Um, Professor Vukosi Maravate at the University of Pretoria, whose company, um, it's called uh, Masakane NLP, uh, seeks to spur the development of NLP research on African languages. Um, and there's a whole lot of initiatives like this that we've started to see in recent years. But um, I do want to make one thing clear, which is that 
collecting more data is not the universal solution to issues of missing and biased data. So collecting data on vulnerable populations can very often lead to unwanted exposure um, or even outright harm. Um, and in far too many cases, efforts to bring so-called sort of low resource languages into AI models only end up just reproducing existing power differentials. And I think it's very significant that in each of the projects that you see up here on the screen, these are each led by people from the communities that they seek to support with their work. So this brings me to a broader principle that can help guide us, all of us, in this type of work, um, you know, including those of us doing research in the United States, white people like me, uh, academic researcher, researchers in these relative positions of privilege. I mean, essentially, it's a feminist principle. It derives from really sort of longstanding feminist theory, um, fem folks in feminist science and technology studies like Sandra Harding, Donna Haraway, folks like that. And it has to do with the idea of embracing pluralism. So this essentially means listening to and learning from a range of sources of knowledge. And what's exciting is that we've actually started to see some of these participatory practices show up in data science and in data-driven research. And actually, um, one of Catherine's recent projects that she talks about in the book has tried to mobilize this principle in the development of AI systems. And so I want to return to that for a minute to talk about this now. So, this is the Data Against Feminicide project, which has sought to build AI systems and sort of digital tools more broadly to support data activists like Maria Salguero. Um, and you know, there are actually a lot of parts of the project, and I won't talk about all of them right now, but I'll just talk for a minute about the participatory AI development part. And so Catherine and her team really prioritized listening to the data activists themselves and learning from them what tools they might or might not need. And one of the other really important parts of this process is that building a tool was not a foregone conclusion. So Catherine and her group held brainstorming workshops to discuss whether digital tools could help to streamline these activists' work um, or reduce the emotional toll of this kind of work and the, work, the toll that it was taking on them, um, or whether it would just sort of displace the work and mean just work of a different form. You know, it's been... Uh, real iterative process over more than three years. But one of the exciting things, and I think a testament to the success of the project, is that the Data Against Feminicide group has now built two tools that are being used by over 40 human rights monitoring groups. Um, so this is the tool that you see over here. Um, it's an email alerts tool, very similar to Google Alerts, um, for surfacing feminicide cases to activists. Um, and actually, there's a, there's a really interesting set of papers about this that talks even about the differences um, in the ways in which news coverage of these crimes are treated on the basis of who the person was um, and sort of which facets of their identity the news reporters chose to surface in reporting on their killing versus the ones that they chose to sort of cover up. Um, but just speaking sort of on a personal level, one of the really interesting things that I found when talking to Catherine throughout this project um, was the sort of general realization that the activist groups actually did not want to fully automate their feminicide work. They didn't, in a lot of cases, want it to become any faster. And this is because the activists consider the work that they do to be care work. So they saw the time that they spent processing the data, reconciling these records, filling in the missing information as a way of really stewarding the memories and honoring the lives of these killed women. And part of the point of the project overall was refusing to let these women be forgotten by the state or by the media. And so the activists did not want to delegate this kind of work to AI. And so I've been reflecting on this and asking myself, like, why is it so surprising? Why is this such a revelation to learn that there's some kinds of work that you know, people don't want machines to take over, or they do not want to speed up, even if it might mean more free time for them? And you know, what it really comes back to is another principle of data feminism, um, which has to do with the importance of elevating emotion um, 
in addition to reason as qualities, as sort of areas and uh, aspects of knowledge. And this idea that we should just accept the value um, in emotional labor, in things like care work, just as people might accept sort of as a basic fact that like, you know, rational empirical knowledge that we gain about the world, this is also something that we can derive knowledge from. And I was, I was like, why was, this so, why was this so surprising to me? Why didn't I just come to this project with that perspective already in mind and you know to me it really pointed to the fact that there are these sort of hidden hierarchies in the forms of knowledge that we know to exist in the world that are underlying a lot of the valuations of the types of knowledge that we produce um, and th this realization actually you know it is a feminist one and I want to sort of take a little detour into feminist theory land in order to explain why this is true um, so feminist theory, one of the sort of earliest interventions um, was to show how binary distinctions um, are usually hiding a hierarchy, right, with one group on the top and the other on the bottom. And the obvious example here is the gender binary, um, the idea of man and the idea of woman. Um, we know this is a false binary because there are more than two genders. But once you see the hierarchy, you start to understand why the hard line between these two groups is there in the first place. It's a protective move, right? And it's there to ensure that the group on top is able to stay there and the group on the bottom isn't able to get up in there and take or sort of uh, redistribute the power that the group on top presently holds. Now, one of the key moves of feminist theorists, though, is to take this critique of the gender binary and to use it to question other binaries and hierarchies that we encounter in the world. Um, so you could think of uh, the distinction between nature and culture, which is a topic of a lot of uh, feminist science and technology studies work. You could think of feminist pedagogy, which challenges the distinction between teacher and student asking why we insist on this sort of artificial hierarchy that places you know, me up here on the podium uh, above all of you in the room when the reality is that we're always learning from each other all of the time. You start to identify how this move, like I said before, is protective. Um, it's essentially uh, protective of the power that the group on top has previously held. And I think in the context of AI, this critique or this sort of theoretical dismantling of false binaries and unequal hierarchies, one of the things that it lets us do is cut through a few different facets of like the AI hype that we hear all the time around us. So first, um, the belief that AI is unequivocally good um, because it's rational and objective, unlike you know, us like deeply emotional and subjective human beings who are not to be trusted. Um, and second, uh, also that it is somehow simultaneously rational, objective, and so magical and mysterious that we lowly humans like can't possibly even begin to understand how it works. Um, and I really see both of these as power moves because the thing is, the big tech corporations who are training these models and deploying these systems, they want us to believe in the magical superhuman capabilities of these AI systems because if they're too mysterious or too complicated for us to understand, then these companies are let off the hook for the actual problems that these systems are causing in the world right now. And if you stop to think about it, these problems have very real and direct sources, you know, like sexism, like racism. Um, and so this is the thing, um, you know, we do know how to address these issues, but they're not the issues or the interventions that the tech companies want to take on. And so this starts to bring me up just to my last few slides. I actually realized I forgot to start my, or stop my clock. So it says I've been speaking for 101 minutes, which I know is wrong, but I don't know where I'm at, um, but I'm almost done. Um, so the sociologist and uh, recent Genius Award winner, Ruha Benjamin, um, has been writing recently about default settings. Um, and by this, she means the options and outcomes of technology um, that remain if the status quo is just sort of like left unchecked, right? So with respect to AI, we can already see how its default settings will result in an acceleration, um, an exacerbation of racism, of sexism, of colonialism, and more. Um, these default settings for these AI systems, they will concentrate power in the hands of the already powerful, and they'll continue to whittle away the power of everyone else. But this is the thing. As AI researchers, as academics, as students, as scholars, um, or even people in industry, you know, we don't have to accept these default settings. That's all they are. They're just the default. They can be changed. 
And so this really brings me to the final point that I want to make, which I hope by now is obvious, and it's that AI really needs feminism and more, right? Um, so, you know, looking back to like 2018, 2019, when Catherine and I were thinking through these principles of data feminism, what we wrote about the centrality of power, it was really depressingly prescient. Um, you know, Meredith Whitaker, she's not the only one, but she has a really great piece talking about how we in academia are experiencing nothing less than the corporate capture of AI research. Um, its design and its development, its regulation or the lack thereof. Um, you know, we're all, you know, like we are, we are seeing the power that we used to hold as academics to decide what we wanted to research on, um, to be able to fund the research that we wanted to undertake. This, these things are being taken away from us as we need to now apply for funding to the AI companies that then approve the types of research that they want to see happen. Um, you know, these are also all consistent with academic critiques of capitalism and also of colonialism, which we really need to return to, um, not only for insight about why this is happening, but also for strategies of resistance. But the recent explosion of AI research and AI systems, along with all of their compute requirements that I think thankfully now are becoming more and more covered by the national news, um, these have brought more considerations to the fore. So for one, there are the environmental costs of training these systems, um, which take our already limited natural resources like water and energy away from people and communities and towards cooling data centers and GPUs. Um, there's an increasing number of really good people working in this space, but I think we really need more climate scientists more environmental studies students working to understand and address why this is happening. Um, then there are the human costs. So we've known for several years about the role that Amazon has played in cloud storage for ICE, for example, how Google developed technology to make drone strikes more accurate, um, which they then sold to the US government. This was Project Maven, um, which you might recall a couple of years ago was the source of a Google-led worker protest to and terminate that contract. Um, but now we're seeing this nearly identical object detection software being put to use right now, both in Ukraine and in Gaza, um, in what people are describing as the first AI wars. And you know, I think it's really worth pausing for a moment to reflect on how the ultimate use case for the set of technologies that were truly intended, are truly intended to benefit humanity, um, as it turns out, are causing the literal destruction of humanity instead. But I, I do want to try to end on a note of hope, which is that, you know, like I said in the beginning, these AI systems, they are incredibly powerful, but they're only as powerful as the data on which they are trained, the conditions under which they're put to use, um, and the context in which and for which they are developed. And if we're going to imagine alternative conditions for their development, an alternative context for their use, then I think Feminism has a very real role to play. These are contexts that empower rather than disempower. These are ones that rebalance the existing structures of power that affect our world today. Um, and I think you know it's an interventionist role. It's a political one. And I think that's important to say out loud. Technology is not neutral. None of the choices that we make are. Um, and in this particular case, it's not neutral because it challenges these default settings of models um, and data sets and systems. And it does so with a goal that hopefully all of you share, which is designing technology that works towards liberation and not just resource extraction. So that's where I'm going to end my formal remarks. Um, I think that we do still have time, and I'd be really interested to hear your questions and your responses to this. Here are many, many different ways to get in contact with both me and Catherine now that we live in this world of social media collapse. You can also just email us. Um, thank you for listening, <laughs> and I'm eager to hear your ideas. So thank you, Lauren. We're going to do round robins to make sure that we accommodate all of our different types of audiences. And we ask that when people register that they submit many questions. And I got a whole bunch of them, so I prioritized some. So we have our first question here, Lauren. And then we're going to come to you in the group here. So if you have questions, start formulating them. So this one is on indigenous uses of data. 
Given the growing impact of AI on the digital divide, how do you see the principles of indigenous data sovereignty aligning with or challenging current AI practices? And as an example, in particular, how can feminist data ethics help address the unique concerns of indigenous communities in the context of AI-driven data collection and usage? By the way, this person says, I trusted ChatGPT to generate this question. <laughs> <laughs> a little meta moment, okay. Um, okay, teachable moment. Um, so this chat GPT generated question I think has gotten some things right, like the concepts of feminist data practices. Those are, that's a real thing. It's not just me and Catherine who have these ideas. There's a whole body of work um, that for a long time has been thinking through the same thing for indigenous data sovereignty. Um, this is a longstanding commitment of indigenous peoples and nations to develop data practices for themselves, for their own benefit, both very important sources of knowledge and guidance. Um, when, uh, when considering sort of alternatives to mainstream or sort of corporate data practices. Um, you know, so I think, you know, again, it's like ChatGPT, like it like sort of gets the right things, not always in the same relationship in the right order. Um, but, you know, in terms of what uh, sort of feminism or sort of like what the question of like what we can learn from indigenous data practices or how feminist data ethics can apply to indigenous data sovereignty, I think there's a couple of things to disambiguate. So one is um, one of the main tenets of indigenous data sovereignty is the sovereignty part. Um, so I, a settler person, should not be saying this is how I think you should do it. Um, I think that it's really important to recognize that there are histories of data that have been, um, you know, really a destructive, disempowering that have to do with the loss of land and life. And there's real and historical um, reasons for not wanting to engage in data collection or data analysis at all, and also being fiercely protective of data that might actually document cultures that have just been subject to centuries of extraction. So, you know, you should all know about that. Um, it's really important. That is not, it's not sort of my place to say they should listen to me. Um, with that said, you know, there are some really nice principles that have come up out of the work of indigenous data sovereignty that I think sort of serve as beacons for us. And one of them, so there are these sort of two sets of principles that have to do with indigenous governance, um, indigenous culture, and then sort of like sort of pool together in indigenous data practices. And they're the care principles and the fair principles. The fair principles are sort of more gen uh, generally applied to data practices, but the care principles, which are particularly um, sort of indigenous in derivation, I think are worth thinking about. Um, and let me think about what the acronym stands for. So C is that they're collectively determined. A has something to do with authority and the importance of an or agency and ensuring that the people creating the data about whom the data uh, what the data is about, they are the ones who are making decisions about the data that is representing their cultures and their lives. Um, the R has to do with responsibility, um, which has to do with thinking through what your responsibilities are to the people you're working with or um, sort of on behalf of. You know, have you really thought through what your responsibilities and commitments are? Um, and are, are those sincere and carried through over time? And that's another, uh, sort of principle that I think we could all be asking ourselves in any work that we do. And the E, is that empowerment? What is the E? Actually, I'm forgetting at this moment. Anyway, you can look it up. There's actually, there's some really beautiful infographics that have been created by a team at Arizona State that you can look up, um, some policy documents and the like. But again, you know, I think one of the things that we try to do with data feminism that I think is also operational with these care principles is develop principles coming up from the people and the theories and the communities that have sort of given rise to a particular movement and then identify which concepts can be translated ethically, which concepts we can learn from even if we should not take them and just sort of plop them into a new context. And I think also the fact that those are not the only two, right? There are so many types of these frameworks and each one has something to offer. So when I say, you know, like we need data feminism and more, like really emphasis on the more. There are so many different ways that we can learn from and use to structure our data work. And I would just encourage you to sort of keep researching and keep learning until you find some that resonate with you. Thank you, Lauren. Do we have a question in the live audience? Wait, hang, let, let, me, let me bring it. Yeah, so the people on Zoom can hear you. We want to make sure. My voice is kind of loud, so I don't okay. think. Yeah, yes. Please, please. Um, yeah, so I, 
Uh, hi, so my name is Hung. Um, I'm a freshman biological science major. And uh, I'm here to speak today. I'm pretty um, interested in um, the relationship between like feminism and data science. And I wonder why you choose to um, uh, write this book with your um, cohorts. Um, Catherine? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, that's a really good question. And one of the, um, one of, it's a question we actually, we get like a version of a lot because people sometimes say like, this isn't feminist data science. This is just like good data science. How come you didn't just call this book like doing better data science? But, which is true. This is doing better data, data science empirically and objectively. Um, but it was really important to me and Catherine to pay respect to the thinking that really informed a lot of our own work on the subject. So like I was just saying, you know, there's all sorts of theories that can sort of structure your own approach to your research, the reasons why you pick you know, certain classes and certain research questions to focus on, the reasons why you might not pay attention to others. And for both me and Catherine, what had proven to be the most illuminating and expansive and capacious set of theories for working with data for us were these feminist theories. And we were a little bit loose with what we pulled into things under the feminist umbrella, to be sure. Um, you know, people are definitely right to quibble about our somewhat, uh, somewhat loose aggregation of concepts. But, you know, really, you know, some of the principles that I talked about before that, you know, feminism is about power, about understanding unequal power. It's not just like about ladies, you know, like that's a real, uh, that's really important to take away because it's true. Um, the reason why people care about ladies is because they are an example of unequal power, right? Um, and so that we saw, like I said, in the beginning of the talk, seemed like there was a very direct connection to these power differentials we were seeing with data. The second, I think, has to do, and this is where Catherine and I personally probably have different principles that speak to us personally, but we sort of pulled them together, feminist. Um, you know, like, Catherine has done a lot of work with uh, uh, participatory design and these approaches to pluralistic uh, data science and HCI research. You know, but for me, it's a lot of these theoretical or formal structures that help us understand, like, why we think certain ways and why we might not be thinking in other ways. And for me, once I sort of understand the reason why we've been led into certain patterns, it helps me see how I can break out of them. So the slide that I had there up on the screen, the pink one, um, about like dismantling binaries and hierarchies, that one is a really powerful one. And that one comes out of, honestly, you know, like, you know, feminist post-structuralist theory, which in turn came from theories of language and theories of how language and meaning work in the world. But that's a feminist tradition that you know, I learned in college, to be honest. When I was a junior, I took a theory class, and it like, exploded my world. And so I think my goal there was really to try to you know, expand the worlds of everyone else. <laughs> I think we have a question from online. Um, someone in chat said, do you think it's important to have some data science expertise or experience to make a difference in data ethics or activism? Oh, good question. Um, I'm going to say yes and no. Like, I think, on the one hand, do I think it's important to have some expertise in data science in order to contribute to data ethics? Like, absolutely. The more technical knowledge and the more um, nuance and depth with which you understand how these systems work, then the more targeted and precise your critiques can be. And that's something that I try to adhere to in my own work. Like, I actually do a lot of technical work. I didn't present on any of it today, but I do a lot of NLP work. I do work using these language models. And it's usually so that I can understand them at the level that my computer science research peers do, so that I can then levy critiques that will be heard and respected, rather than just ones that are sort of uh, pitched from the outside. With that said, I also see how how easy it is to dismiss critiques that are coming from non-technical researchers only on the grounds that they do not understand what's going on under the hood, because the reality is that these systems are so complex that any single research project right now involves so many different collaborators, each bringing their own little area of specialized knowledge. Like they've done these studies about the number of co-authors in technical papers in the past five years, and it's like exponential. And this is because there's no single person who understands anything. And so 
if you are someone who wants to say something about how the systems that sort of structure or underlie these systems work, that is coming from a humanistic lens or a social scientific lens, or even a technical lens like a mathy lens that doesn't have to do with computer science, then by all means, yes, you should say that. I think you need to do some research to understand the language that will be understood and is easily, more easily translated across disciplines, which is another kind of learning. But I do not think it should ever be a barrier to saying something that you think is important or true. Because I think that's another one of these protective moves that we see all the time, saying like, oh, those humanists, they don't understand what we do, therefore we don't need to listen to them. When in fact, as I was saying in this talk, you know, all these ideas about capitalism, about colonialism, about the ways in which the landscape of work has been striated. These have been theorized for you know, over a century by people who were not technical at all. There were not even these types of computers you know, when these people were having these theories, yet they still very much apply. Do we have another question in the audience? Hi, this is Rhonda Holberton. I'm the artist and chair of the art and art history department. Um, to dovetail a little bit on that last question, you talked a little bit about what we need in order to kind of dismantle some of these power structures that are accelerating um, inequitable access to both resources, data, and sovereignty more, more broadly. And that they needed to be not just ideas, but frameworks of action. And so in your studies, have you found frameworks of action either through kind of feminist discourse, post-colonial discourse, where, where you see the biggest pressure points are the most like lowest hanging fruit mm. for folks who are interested in engaging kind of a, a, a radical act of, yeah, pressure. Uh, okay, so, so frameworks for action, I will say the most, um, the most exciting work to me right now has, has to do with these participatory models of AI design and development. So there's a number of projects. Catherine's is one of them, but there's work being uh, taking place in the um, maternal health space by someone named Maria Antoniak. A lot of these just have to do with talking to populations who are imagined to be helped by some sort of new AI tool or app or something and saying like, A of all, do you really want this? And B of all, if there were to be a tool that could help ease, you know, help ease your life in some way, what would you want it to do? Where would you want it to, where would you want to encounter it? You know, at what point in the progression of whatever it is that you're experiencing or how you live your lives. And then on that basis, sort of formulating design principles that then guide the work. And the fact that there are an increasing number of examples of this show to me that if we are going to de develop systems that truly are beneficial and are not just sort of given to us and then we need to you know, react to them, then this is the kind of design process that needs to be followed. Same thing with the curation of data sets. You know, it used to be, like a, used to be in the olden times, six months ago, um, that you know, it was like, oh, well, you know, to train large language models, you need big data. And if you have small curated data, then, well, you could use those old models, but you know, like you can't get your research published and whatever, that doesn't matter anymore. We are now sort of seeing uh, sort of a full circle where the people who are developing and training these large language models are recognizing the real limitations of the data that they have, which is that it comes from the internet, right? And the internet, like, you know, even if you go back to the very early days of the internet is what, like the 90s, um, which I know all the students think is like literally the olden days, but I was alive, so it's not that far old. But like the internet, it's like, it's, and um, you know, like the, we know the demographics of who produces content on the internet, you know, it's like hugely male, it's US based, the, dem the biggest, age rep bracket is ages 19 to 34, and like that group is great, but I'm not sure I want them giving me medical advice, this kind of thing. Um, so anyway, so it's really hard to get data that is equal in size to this big body of data that represents like the internet circa 2023. And so now we're seeing really interesting methods that um, sort of have to do with uh, like, layering in, in effect, um, smaller data sets and enabling the models to respond more to the differences they perceive in the smaller bespoke data sets that, um, uh, in ways that reflect the, the knowledge that's coming in through that data. Same thing with trying to build models that are trained on, like, 
entire other data sets from the ground up. You know, all that said, the friction points are, um, you know, the bigger models still remain under control of these big corporations, and you cannot create a wall between the data that you know about and the data that you don't know about. In some cases, not all of them, if you are, for example, using like prompting to and add more information into your data, like sometimes it goes back to the company and then they take your data, and this matters if you care about it or if it has sensitive information, um, you know, and so, and then there's a question of like, you know, should the goal just be to train big models with all the information? Like there's been this really interesting project about that was intended to intervene into the lack of black representation in these large language models. It's a black-led project, and they're like, we want to build a black language model. And some people are like, great, we want this. And other people are like, I don't want my language in a language model. Like, no, thank you. I'm fine with my stuff being left out of that model. And so there's not this one-size-fits-all solution. Um, and similarly, with these participatory processes, they take time, they take money, they do not move quickly. And you know, like we still live, you more than me, I'm on the East Coast, but you live in this like move fast and break things mentality. And sometimes it's really hard to push back against these really fast timelines um, for product development, even if you know the b way to the best product or the thing that will help people the most is um, to move more slowly. And so I think that's always going to be a pressure point. And that's also the reason why I think we will always need people doing this work because I do not think realistically we will arrive in the world where like Sam Altman is like, I've changed my mind. I'm gonna be a feminist AI developer. Like we know that's not going to happen, but we do need people trying to give voice to or crucially provide examples of alternatives to ways that this can be done so that we can choose, you know, which path we want to take. I think we have one more question right up front, and then we're going to turn to the raffle, and then we're going to turn to a closing, and then we're going to go to food. Oh my gosh, I've just, never given a talk with a raffle uh, yeah. before. <laughs> just so the students around, and also just to warn you, Lauren, all my students have to get a selfie with you. Oh no. <laughs> Individually. Oh no. <laughs> before, I forgot to tell you that. <laughs> Hi, Lauren. I'm Priya Kanan, and um, First of all, thank you for a fascinating talk. And everything you said resonated with me from you know, all of Anthony Giddens' work on signification, legitimation, and all that stuff. The question I have for you is each and every one of us comes from a place of privilege and from a place of oppression at the same time. Mm -hmm. And we have our own blind spots towards what might not work for others. What's your advice on how we train our next generation of students on how to do more with data feminism that you're talking about? Oh, I love that question. So I appreciate what you said, and it actually is something, there's a lot, Patricia Hill Collins has a line, I believe in black feminist thought, where she says something very similar. She says something like, no single one of us is pure victim or pure oppressor. And I always make sure to quote that line in all of my classes, because I think it's so true, right? I mean, one of the basic tenets of feminism is it's never a binary, right? Everything is both and, not either or. And so I think that's really important to bear in mind. And I think it's also liberating, especially for students who are like, I'm worried that I might not know enough, or I don't want to make the wrong move. I do want to help, but like, I'm just not sure. I think it's really important to recognize um, that you're right, there's all aspects of exper our, our individual experience that allow us to connect to different parts of other people. I mean, my own experience, it really, and this is gonna sound sort of like I'm just saying the same thing over and over again, but it's true, is really to embrace this idea of pluralism, you know, which really just means that whenever possible, bringing together multiple perspectives and recognizing that we learn the most when we pull together these multiple perspectives, like Donna Haraway has this metaphor in um, her famous Situated Knowledges essay of the, the eye of the bee, the compound eye, you know, which is composed of all these little, oh, you're hexagons, you're SJSU hexagons. Um, but her point is that, you know, we should understand knowledge the way the bee produces an image, which is that these different individual viewpoints come together and produce uh, more precise, um, a deeper or richer and sort of more uh, information-filled picture of the world than we would have with only one individually. And when I think, I really like that metaphor because when you say it like that, it's like, who wouldn't want to be a feminist data scientist, right? Shouldn't we all want more knowledge, more precise knowledge, more nuance and depth with which we understand the world? Um, the answer is like, yes, and if you don't, 
I guess I don't have anything to say to you. Um, but if we do under, if you know, if we can agree that like this is what we want, then I think it really opens ourselves up to learn from everyone and to understand where we all connect with each other and how we can bring together the knowledge that we each individually bring to the table in the service of the greater goal. So. Thank you, Lauren. I think we're going to reverse it a little bit and, and invite Dean Miller up to do the closing. Then we'll do the raffle. Sure. But thank, thank you, Lauren. We'll give you a little bit break. And can we give her a round of applause? Thank you so much. Um, well, I just am here to say thank you, but I'm so excited about the raffle. I'm holding the ticket in my hand. So, um, you know, got to come through with that, Kathy. Um, Thank you, Lauren. This was a fantastic talk. So, um, so wide ranging, touching on so many different areas and fields and so many different disciplines within the university. A really great example of what we want to be having here in terms of our talks and the kind of thing that our Digital Humanities Center can support. Huge thank you to our sponsors for the event, for the event including the Lucas College of Business, and Dean Priya Cannon for making a donation to this, to the Charles Davidson College of Engineering and Dean uh, Sh Cheryl Ehrman, uh, the College of Humanities and Arts, the Department of Humanities, thank you so much to Todd Ormsby and to Kim Knight for, for beginning this, um, pushing this forward, um, to Nada Attar and Circle, which you've heard quite a bit about, the Mozilla funded uh, activities on campus, which I'm so excited by. Um, and uh, to Dora Hoffman and Michelle v uh, Vinegron from the Committee on Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Social Justice from the College Inf of Information, Data, and Society. And thank you so much, not only for the uh, Students Responsible Commuting Club and Julia, Husan Zada, who I just met, but all the work that you guys were doing for us through this. This is fantastic. An enormous thank you to the people who made this happen on the ground. To Kathy Harris, who just can, can arrange the most amazing events, um, she brought 70 people to this and hundreds of people to uh, the webinar online. And thank you to the library staff, to Anthony Sutton and the amazing Hammer production team, and to my office staff, including Elizabeth Quintana, who is not here, but to Kathy and Melissa, who are, who are gonna make it possible for you guys to have food in just a second. So I'm going to finish with this. Uh, please fill out the engagement survey. You can either do this by hitting on this QR code, but we will not let you go that easily. If you do not fill out the QR code, you'll get an email. It really helps us to hear your responses to the events that we're doing. It helps us fund future events. It helps us uh, uh, establish the groundwork for getting grants. Um, and it tells us what you like and what you might like to see more of. So please do fill that out. I hope you take a look at the swag at uh, uh, materials from different units, uh, pick up those little power chargers, and please stay after the raffle for the Caribbean food that's been delivered silently and effectively while you were busy with this great talk uh, that has been provide provided to us by Circle. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. Here we go with the raffle. Melissa's bringing up. So what's being raffled off are print copies of Data Feminism, and I think this is the 2024 version.